My guest on CoinGeek Conversations this week is Alex Favell, a British entrepreneur based in the Netherlands who has two Bitcoin SV projects underway, an app that secures identity information inside picture files and an ambitious venture capital fund for BSV startups. So I hope you enjoy our conversation about both of those and more. You're listening to CoinGeek Conversations with Charles Miller. Welcome to CoinGeek Conversations, and I'm very pleased to have Alex Favell with me today. So, Alex, thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. Happy to be here. So, let's start off by talking about your very interesting venture fund for Bitcoin SV. T- tell me a little bit about that, would you? So, uh, I started and founded a venture capital fund that is focused solely on uh, enacting Satoshi's vision. Uh, so we invest uh, fiat in exchange for equity or debt instruments uh, in companies that are building on BSV and BSV only. We are not interested in any other technology other than what Satoshi created. So it's called Two Hot Ventures. Correct. It's based in the Netherlands. Yep. Is it like a, a, a typical venture fund where you gather money in from investors and then you as the fund will decide how to distribute it amongst startups? Yep. That's exactly how it works. And and what sort of stage have you reached and what kind of ambitions do you have for it then? So um, not a lot of people know how venture capital funds are structured, so I'll give a bit of an overview of that. You come up with an investment thesis, you uh, create some company structures, and then you uh, go and solicit investment. Um, You have a set time period where you can raise the money. And then you have a set time period where you can uh, distribute the money. And that's all written into the... And that's all written into the constitutions and just shareholder agreements right. and things like that. And then you have a set period where you can harvest the investment to regain, to distribute dividends to the investors. Um, at the moment, we have performed our initial closing, which we, means we have outside money from an investor. And we have given to ourselves 18 months, which is typical, to raise the, the full amount of money. Uh, we can start making investments at any time. So we actually made some investments before the fund was formed. We warehoused them and then now they've been transferred to the fund. And how much money are you trying to raise? We're trying to raise 40 million euros. Why do you have such a broad smile on your face when, um, when you mention that figure? It, is it, it, sound, of it sounds like a lot of money. Um, it and is a lot of money. For a lot of people, it is, is a lot of money. But when you're trying to raise, uh, to run a fund for 10 years, There are a lot of costs for that. So you have to balance a reasonable amount that you can think you can raise with what is achievable. So um, what is achievable to to make money from? So for example, SoftBank's vision fund of $100 billion that is also venture capital, it goes against what venture capital is supposed to be because venture capital, you're supposed to inject a small amount of money in a risky startup and then add to it as it grows. When you're talking about a company that's, you know, a a billion dollars, you should be thinking about going public. You know, there there are big visions that require a lot of money, but a hundred billion is more than one fund should ever, I think, manage. For moral reasons or what? Well, just because it's it's not a effective investment strategy to pour 50 million dollars into a tiny startup that has four employees. Well, you're sort of creating a market by sort of brute force, aren't you're you? You're trying to, but money does not solve problems. Hmm. People solve problems, and you should try and find the right people to give the right amount of money. Money corrupts, right? And it, because money is power, and as soon as you validate someone's ideas by handing them a lot of money, they may... Uh, they may start using that money to do things that they shouldn't necessarily be doing. Right, so your approach will be smaller amounts of money to mm-hmm. a larger number of startups. To an extent, yeah. yeah. Um, we, we do have a restriction that uh, is not hard and fast, but we're aiming to keep our portfolio to about 15 companies. Um, so we're looking to make smaller investments, and then if those are successful and we like the way the company is going, we'll will uh, participate in the next funding rounds. And, and do you think there are enough investors out there who want to put money into Bitcoin SV that you're going to reach your 40 million? Um, 
It's a difficult thing to judge at this stage um, because you know we we've been battered in the market so much, and people are investing in the coin if they like the vision. Um, but I don't necessarily see a value in the coin itself, simply because uh, it feels like you're giving control over your own investment to everyone else in the market. Uh, these markets are very low liquidity, so they're very easily to manipulate. And if you're trying to run a business with costs in, in fiat, uh, if you, know, you receive an investment and then suddenly in a week you've got half the money, that's a problem. Uh, that's a big problem for the future of your company that you shouldn't, it, you're doubling your risk when you shouldn't be. And I think it's a difficult thing to convince people that there is value in the businesses when Bitcoin SV has so far to go from an industry perspective. So there is a balance between investing in the coin and investing in the ecosystem and the people that are actually going to produce that value that you expect to be there. In a way, that kind of volatility, even when it's upward, mm -hmm. is not necessarily a good thing, is it? Because no. it takes people's eye off yes. what you're talking about, yes. which is actually building something more sustainable. Yes, a, a lot of the problems with the ICOs is the fact that they've got a share price, a share price that trades daily. It, if it goes up one day, they think they've done something successful, when in actuality, nothing changed from one day to the next. If the price goes down, that might be because an investor needs to sell their position because they need to pay taxes, for example. Um, and that distracts everyone in the company to that metric. I mean, a startup's valuation changes maybe once every year when they raise new money. And that doesn't necessarily have an effect on the way the business is run. But an ICO, for example, if they are worth $1 million and then suddenly they're worth $100 million, that changes the way they act. It changes what they allocate resources to. Even if you can solve the sort of the volatility problem or the psychological mm. problems that arise from the volatility of Bitcoin SV, what about another thought that I've read, which is that it's not the same as the internet, the blo no. blockchain economy, yeah. uh, because the value is in the protocol in mm -hmm. the sense that data and the money side of things will actually be embedded in the protocol and therefore the apps or services that are built on top of it mm -hmm. may not have the kind of value that a Facebook or other tech giants will, can create out of producing something that works on the internet. Well, a protocol itself I don't think has value simply because it's like saying English has value in a, in a monetary sense. It's a tool, right? Mm. You can use that tool however you want, but it's, and you can derive value from that, but at the end of the day, it's a business or a person that derives value from it. Um, so it is in many respects very similar to the way the internet bubble happened. Uh, it's just that during the, the, the tech bubble of the 2000s, the, the protocol was decided and it's all the protocols that you put on top of those base set of protocols that can derive massive amounts of value for the businesses and for the people that are using them. But if you look at Google, for instance, mm -hmm. it owns all the data that it collects from its users. Yep. It, in, in that sense, it's got a solid asset. Uh, the equivalent uh, Correct, but Bitcoin app wouldn't own that information, would it? That depends. Um, I actually don't think that Google is legally acquiring this data from their users because there isn't consideration. So what does that mean? Consideration means that uh, there is a, a point in time where a user or a company pays for value. So pays for a service, pays for a They've product. just helped themselves basically. But at the moment, users don't know that they're, what they're giving up is valuable because they're not being paid for it. As soon as someone puts a price on it, the user recognizes maybe this is something that I shouldn't give or maybe that's not enough. I, I don't want to necessarily say right. that there's going to be mass class action lawsuits against mm. these companies, 
Um, but but we don't I, I wouldn't say it was outside of the realm of possibility. Right, but we don't really want the success of BSV to have to wait for the collapse of Google. No. I mean, I mean that's no. too far ahead, yeah. probably. Yeah. In, in your prospectus for 2Hop, I saw that you, you are talking about investing in companies that uh, concentrate on the infrastructure layer, yeah. not consumer products. Is Correct. that right? Correct. What's the thinking there, then? Um, there is much more value there. Um, and what, what do you mean by the infrastructure layer? So, a lot of companies on the internet may start as user-facing, but they find that it's actually quite difficult to make money from these users, so they end up uh, migrating into the infrastructure layer. So, for, for example, Amazon, right? It was a shop user-facing online when it started, but now it makes all of its money from infrastructure. Um, we think that that's actually going to flip on its head in that all the value at the beginning is going to be infrastructure simply maybe because users don't trust it. So they don't even, they shouldn't even see it. They, they should be unaware of the technology stack of the products that they're using. So with Amazon, the infrastructure value is in Amazon Web Services, you mean, right? Yes. But so what would be the... But also the logistics. Oh, right. But... The logistics are only successful if there are enough consumers out there buying stuff, using Correct. it, right? Yeah. But, but so what would be the equivalent in the Bitcoin world then? Um, well, so like, uh, I know Craig and a, a lot of people, they like to talk about EDI. Which is? Uh, electronic Data Interchange. Um, so that is a, a very large market that basically dictates how companies communicate logistics between themselves. Um, it, that is also a very vulnerable part on the existing internet because if you can make a small change to every time someone does something without them realizing they can lose a lot. Um, that kind of infrastructure is very very interesting but those industries move slow. So what we're really looking for at 2Hop is something that the internet cannot do that people aren't even necessarily aware of, but they need desperately. Um, so the reason why we invested in uh, Pixel Wallet first of all is because to legally own a digital asset is very, very difficult right now. Um, and if the asset is controlled by a number that you can transfer between users, so like a private key, if I can extract that and give it to someone else without any consequence, it's not actually possible to legally own something because then there's always the question of, well, are you the only one with the keys? How do you do a custodial service if you can't prove you are the only one that controls it? And that technological problem is not likely to be solved by technology. It's more likely to be solved by law. It's more likely possible to solve it by saying, I attest to these keys by putting my identity behind them. Right, so just let's step, step back a bit for people who haven't come across Pixel Wallet. Yep. Can you just give us a quick sketch of, of what that is exactly? So Pixel Wallet is a uh, mechanism of putting data on chain. It can be any data. Uh, it's a general sort of solution to the problem of encryption eventually being broken through the passage of time. So, um, so we used to use, you know, 60-bit uh, encryption or 68-bit encryption. That is now possible to break just because we're faster at searching the, for the private keys of that, uh, of those, that size. Um, but if you're putting stuff on an immutable blockchain that the information will be there for the next 100 years, that means that the the data will always come out. Um, but there are other problems in that uh, Alan Turing proved that uh, it's possible to break encryption through statistical methods. So you can, if you know of a repeated message inside uh, uh, something that's encrypted, you can analyze the, the message so that you can reduce the search space that you're looking for. And suddenly a 256-bit private key is reduced down to a searchable space, so it's something more comparable to a, 
a 32-bit or something like that. Right, and your solution for these problems is using images. Yes, so what Pixel does, and the reason it's called Pixel, is because we can take an encrypted message and hide that inside a much larger message. So uh, it's effectively like adding random data. In, in the credit card industry, it's, uh, they use something called data masking. So you take your encrypted, uh, your encrypted message and every time that's publicly available, you only make the last four digits uh, available. Right. So you know what you're looking at, but you can't see the full information. Hmm. Um, steganography, which is this process uh, of embedding information into images, is like data masking on steroids. You know, it, it, it takes the concept of data masking to the point where you don't even know whether you're looking at a relevant, image, uh, relevant message. It could just be an image. Um, you can do it with any data. So you can take any arbitrary data set and put it inside any other arbitrary data set. But images are the best because they're the biggest and they have, uh, they have a, the, a large uh, bit size, which means that if you just flip the the last least significant bit, you can't necessarily tell if it's a uh, an arbitrary image. So if you take a photo of this room, for example, or you're looking at the screen, uh, there's a lot of random information in there, and you can't necessarily tell when the last least significant bit of that uh, pixel has changed. So it's kind of like taking a, a red pixel and making it slightly redder, but you're only changing it by a factor of uh, one out of 200. I, I still don't quite understand why, if I, I mean, I don't know how this works, but presumably you can change any Im image into mm. a massive file with mm. a million billion yep. bits in it. Yep. And do the bits that make up the thing that's hidden in it sit next to each other, or, or are they all sort of they, all they over can, the place? They can be randomly distributed. Yeah. Right, so it's, so it's not like you just would have to go through it very carefully until you come across something that looks very strange. Yeah. Uh, I, I like to think of the best practice is to imagine that you're, you're the thing, the, the cover text, we call it, so you take the message and you put it inside some cover text. Um, if you imagine that that cover text is completely uniform, so like it's a pink image and every single pixel is the same. You need to ensure that when you're embedding data that there's no uh, way to see where the data is in that right. image. Right, and it would still work like that? Well, you can, add, you can pad your message with random data, effectively, so. Right, but if, I, if, my, pic if my picture was just a completely perfect uniform color, could I still hide the data in it? Uh, yes, because then the output would effectively be a fuzzy-ish image. Right. But it would be uniformly fuzzy. Right. It's, it's very complicated stuff, it's, this. It's but, quite complicated. Okay, so yeah. supposing Pixel Wallet business booms, mm -hmm. how will people on a daily basis be using this technology? I believe for everything. Hmm. But okay, so I reason, want, what, if I, what, give me an example of something I might do and what, what it would be like to do it. Um, so something you might do is to, uh, is to log into a website. Right. And that website wants to know who you are. So um, the first application we're using Pixel with is uh, KYC. Know your customer. Know your customer. And the reason why it's so important for Pixel to start with this is because if you can publish information on the blockchain privately, with no one knowing who uploaded it, you can upload anything. I mean, really anything. And in, if you look at what's happened to the internet in terms of the type of material that is transmitted over it, you don't see it in the public eye, but human trafficking has increased over the past 20 years for reasons. And it's largely due to the anonymity of the internet. Right, so you're providing an identity system. Yes, a private one. So so that when you put your identity on the blockchain, it's as secure as can be. So it's not just encrypted. And in fact, if you put personally identifiable information out in the public in even in encrypted form, that is 
effectively a data leak and a breach of a lot of regulations. Right, so just going back to the example, supposing I was signed up with Pixel Wallet, yes. I would have my identity yep. on the system, yep. but then how would I use it in a, in a sort of daily activity? So when you initially sign up, you would most likely get a no notification as to what information the service would need from you. So maybe they don't need your name, but they just need to know you're a real person. So you could actually, uh, they would check that there is an identity there and it's been checked by uh, a, a KYC and KYB right, database. So this is, this is, this and is then you put a pseudonym on top of it. Right, so this is if I, if I wanted to use my identity to sign up for some service or yes. something. Yes. And then, but then how does the picture come into it? Uh, the picture comes into it when it's required. So uh, when you sign up for a bank online, right, you typically have to take a picture of your passport and a selfie and those mm. kind of things. Uh, so we allow you to take those pictures. We then embed those inside another picture uh, that is, does not show your personal identifiable information at all. Um, and then who would see that picture? The, the cover text, as it were. Right. That would go on the blockchain. And so, would I ever see the picture that my identity was embedded in or not? Um, probably not. Right. Um, there's not really any need for you to. Uh, but it might right. be a good advertising mechanism for companies. So if, if you sign up with Pixel through another company, hmm. maybe we could sell the cover text as advertising. So that you can show how many people you onboarded, for example. So it really is just a piece of technology, the hiding of the data in the picture. It's nothing to do with a fun picture or anything no, like that. No, no, no. I mean, you can make it a fun picture if you want. Right. But you don't. It doesn't have to be anything specific. So how are you going to take this business forward? Who do you need to persuade to do what to make this at, thing at the fly? moment? At the moment, we're trying to convince. Uh, BSV startups that this is possible, this is compliant, and uh, this is in their best interest. Um, they could, of course, create the technology themselves. We've spent the past year developing it, making sure that it is as secure as it can be. Uh, we have a patent pending on the exact process that we think is the most secure, but we haven't patented the base fundamental technology of steganography on a blockchain. We've patented the, the method of making it what we believe is most secure. Right, so it would be, uh, you know, in the same way that if you sign up to Twitch, mm -hmm. you, have to, uh, you have to have money button, or in fact, I think you can have relay now. Yeah. Um, you're saying that if somebody wants to start a BSV uh, business, maybe they would say that their users have to have Pixel Wallet. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be Pixel Wallet, but I actually think that it's um, in that startup's best interest to know that their customers are real people. So Facebook currently removes 3 million accounts a day for being fake bots. Hmm. That's a big problem because they don't know who they can sell actual products to. Obviously, it's in their advantage in that these bots turn out to be metrics that they charge to advertisers. So they would lose money if they continue, if they remove all of the accounts and they actually find right. out exactly how many users they have. But just going back to the first stage of this, which I don't think I've probably quite understood, how do you stop somebody signing up with Pixel Wallet in a fake way? How do you know that they're a real person or that they're giving the correct details? Um, we check it with a regular authority, just like banks do. Which would be so. What? There, there are services that out there that own. Um, they, they have gone out and aggregate, aggregated public data on on individuals. Right. So, like whether you've been uh, convicted of financial crimes, for example. Right. So that's just a one-off thing, and once you're in the system, then yeah, you uh, can be confident. There is monitoring of that as well, of course, because if I mean. You may not be charged with financial crimes before you sign up, but afterwards, right. the businesses are going to need to So it's just like any right. bank's security process, really. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Alex, you seem to have a sort of foot in both technology and finance. Mm. 
Um, give, tell me a little bit about your background and, and how you managed to acquire this sort of rather wide set of uh, interests and, and skills. Um, I don't know how far back to go because it does go back <laughs> well, quite a long way. Do you way. consider yourself um, a technology guy who's very interested in the, the business side of things mm -hmm. or the other way around? I would probably say I'm definitely a technology guy that's more interested in the business side of things. Um, however, I've always wanted to get into business. I, uh, I studied mechanical engineering at UCL here in London. Um, and after that, I went into the industry itself. Um, I was actually part of uh, a company uh, before and during university as well, a large multinational. It was during my university time that I discovered Bitcoin in 2013. And I was just absolutely fascinated by it simply because no one knew how it worked, hmm. right? Lots of people had very different theories, but the creator, the person that could have explained how it worked, left. The way it was put out was strange, like everything about it was unknown, but it seemed to be important enough that it might just change the world. So I continued researching it until I felt I understood that it was important enough for me to make a big decision about the trajectory of my career. And did you feel that you got to the bottom of really understanding how it works? No, and <laughs> I, I, I don't think I will ever get to the bottom of how exactly how I think it works um, because there are always unknowns. Bitcoin is not really technology. It's Everyone likes to say it's economic, um, but it's more than that. It's us. It's, it's something we interact with as a tool, and it shows us what we want, what we are, how, how we interact with one another. Um, and the way it's being used at the moment is quite scary. Uh, that might be just because people misunderstand the tool, but it's a tool. You can use it to do whatever you want. Um, do you think we're waiting for some sort of particular breakthrough where suddenly it'll become so obvious that Bitcoin solutions are going to be the be all and end all? Or is it just going to be a gradual, slow process where more I think and more it's going to be a gradual, slow process. For each individual, there will be something that they see where they go, that means it's so obvious that this is going to happen. But it never happens to an entire society all at once. It accelerates, definitely. But it never happens overnight, ever. Because with the internet, people were sort of delighted by going onto a computer and discovering. There was often a moment where you first used Google or something, yeah. and you suddenly thought, wow, this is incredible. Yeah. Why doesn't everybody do this? Because it's just so fantastic. Is there going to be an equivalent particular thing that will work in, in this industry? I think industry? it's harder for Bitcoin to achieve that, um, simply because the tools we have are actually very good at fulfilling what we think they should be fulfilling. You mean the internet tools? The internet, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can message someone instantly in Australia. Mm. For yeah, example. exactly. I mean, what, what else could we need? Exactly. You know? uh, that's always the, the fool's mentality of... <laughs> Uh, everything that has been invented is going to be invented, has mm. been invented. Um, we but the are... answer may be that it's all much more behind the scenes stuff exactly. like you're talking about. Yes. That really the average user will benefit from, but indirectly. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I mean, one of, I, I think the best example is everything that is still currently paper that you feel shouldn't be paper. Right? So... I mean, I, I'm quite shocked at how paper-based business is still, right? All the operations of business are typically digital, but the actual filing... In terms actual, of legal papers The actual stuff. legal stuff yeah. side of it is all paper. Yes. And that was quite shocking to me. And, and strangely, handwritten signatures still exactly. seem to have some role. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> when we've been setting up companies, you know, we have to send it one document around the world, right? It literally takes weeks just to get a couple of signatures. This seems barbaric. 
<laughs> I mean, forget money. I mean, the fact that I can talk to someone on the other side of the world instantaneously, mm. but if we want to do anything substantial legally, it takes weeks to months is crazy. Yeah, and that is a problem that this could solve. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Alex. Thank Thanks a lot. Thanks to Alex Favell. Before we end, let me just mention, in case you haven't already signed up, the CoinGeek Conference in London on the 21st and 22nd of February. Lots of great speakers have been booked, and to see who they are, go to coingeekconference.com. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. Bye for now.